Hi there everyone, welcome back to 4 Expedition. Today I'm excited to share with you this new episode. Uh, right now I'm in the middle of the Mojave Desert off of the I-10, just past Blythe. I'm heading right now toward Joshua Tree National Park. I got up around 3.15 this morning. The sun's finally starting to come up so I thought I'd pull off the highway and um, talk with you just a little bit. I'm gonna be spending a little bit of time at Joshua Tree but prior to doing that, I'm going to a place that I haven't been before that I've always wanted to go to. It's uh, located out in Landers, California, which is just outside of Joshua Tree, California. And in Landers is a place called the Integratron. It's a really cool place. It's basically a machine that was built in the 1950s and it's a sound resonance machine. The device is said to have a perfect harmonic resonance inside. We are going to go and spend some time inside the Integratron and have a sound healing bath. As you can see, the sun is just coming up. It's a beautiful morning out here. Temperatures are probably in the 50s. It's a little chilly. It's also very noisy because I'm not too far off the highway and there's a lot of semi-traffic. But I didn't want to miss this opportunity to share this beautiful sunrise with you. But let's take a minute here and just enjoy the sunrise together, shall we? Giant Rock, and Giant Rock is a natural landmark that's about two to two and a half miles north of Integratron down a dirt road. It's very beautiful out here. Um, Giant Rock has a little bit of history. Uh, there's actually, or there actually used to be rooms underneath it that were created by uh, a man that used to live out here years and years ago, but then when George Van Tassel started building Integratron, he discovered this place out here and actually eventually built an airstrip here <clears throat> and it's said that uh, George actually stored some of his food down underneath um, Giant Rock uh, in the rooms down there for some time once he discovered there were rooms underneath but this is where he claims that he had extraterrestrial interaction and the extraterrestrials took him aboard their ship and gave him a model for creating Integratron or the technology behind Integratron uh, there's nobody out here. It's very peaceful and quiet. I do believe that there have been big events out here uh, in the years past. I've read some on the internet. People have come out here for a variety of different interesting spiritual retreats and, and gatherings. And I think there was actually a time when several thousand people came out here for some particular event. But if you look around, which I'll show you, there's um, some definitely some flat areas where it looks like maybe there was a runway at one time. And we're up pretty high in elevation. We're a couple thousand feet above Palm Springs in Landers, or outside of Landers. It's just a very beautiful day out here. Okay, so here we are at Integratron. Got all checked in. Uh, pretty interesting place. Uh, everybody's very, very nice. There's some really cool people here and um, get a little bit of history about Integratron while I'm here.
decided to sleep in the back of the Subaru last night, mainly because it was super windy out. And I did have the rooftop tent positioned where the hard shell clamshell was facing the wind. So when the wind came across, it hits the hard shell and doesn't um, really cause a whole lot of movement of the tent, but the sides flap and the top flaps a little bit. And I didn't want to be kept up all night long, so I just decided to close up the rooftop tent last night and sleep in the back of the Subaru, which is great because I didn't hear any wind. It's very warm in here, certainly long enough for me to sleep. And and it's also very safe and so forth. There are other people camping around. This is uh, BLM land outside of the town of Joshua Tree. And this, this land was recommended to me last time I came here by the National Park as a place to come camp for free. So you come out here and there's, there's a couple campers, you know, maybe 500 yards away uh, in, in most directions around me. So it's not completely private and quiet, but at the same time, it's also a relatively safe environment to camp. So I had a really good night's sleep and I put the pup next to me here on her own bed. I think we'll get up this morning and make some nice breakfast and then head over to the National Park to do a little hike and see if I can find a spot to camp there this evening and then head back to Phoenix tomorrow morning. got this Oz tent table and even though it's extremely sturdy and it comes in a really nice bag I have to say that I'm not really particularly fond of it because it's actually pretty difficult to set up um, it comes folded as you saw here a second ago and basically you have to pull these out flip them over and they're really hard to get into these little slots Then you got to do all this work to put all this together. I used to have a table that I got at Walmart. It was super easy to set up, super lightweight and super compact. And I still have that table, but it's kind of fallen apart after a number of years of use. But nonetheless, um, it was a great little table and it didn't cost more than like 20 bucks. And this one cost me over a hundred dollars. I bought at Overland Expo a couple of years ago, and that was on um, that was their event special at the time. So they make good quality products. They're very durable, uh, but this table is really heavy. It doesn't get that compact when you fold it up, and it's actually fairly difficult to set up and take down. So not my highest recommendation, but again, they make really good, solid products. And I don't see this table breaking down anytime soon, like the one at Walmart did. I got this really nice bathroom bag. I think I got this at Target. You can get them at a lot of different places. But one thing I like about it is when you unzip it, it opens up to a really big um, compartment carrier. What I love is that I can take it right up there on my Yakima rack and I can access my bathroom bag pretty easily there. So I wanted to show you this jet boil stove that I have here. Once I um, decided I was going to do a Subaru Outback and knew that I wasn't going to have an adventure trailer pulling behind it uh, or some sort of interior kitchen, even though this is a very expensive stove, it's also very compact and I just really do love it. Um, again, it's by Jet Boil. 
It comes with this adapter to mount your typical propane canister. It comes in this nice little jet foil bag. When you open it up, you can see that it comes in this um, really compact setup here. It also comes with a wind deflector, which is really cool. Set this aside. And um, basically all you do is you unhook these rubber fasteners and it flips open. You got two burners here. And what I really like about it is that it um, you don't need to actually have a lighter or anything to light it. It's got a um, it's got an igniter here. It's got the dials on the front that um, adjust the temperature. And what's really cool about it is here's your fuel input right here. But on the other side, you can daisy chain it to add a jet link to it, which is an additional burner. So you can actually daisy chain this stove to have multiple burners on one propane attachment here. Well, there is a reason they call this a jet boil. It doesn't take very long. And we got some nice toasty hot water. You know, I don't always eat oatmeal for breakfast when I'm out camping, but most of the videos I've created lately I've used oatmeal packets to make oatmeal breakfast with craisins or something like that. Sometimes I'll come out here and make eggs and bacon or I'll make um, some quinoa thing. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan per se, but I do try to eat a little healthier. These are organic, gluten-free oatmeal packets. I'll probably put some um, craisins in there. I generally don't even use craisins. I'll use an organic cranberry, but I was in kind of a hurry since I just planned this trip on Friday night and headed out at 3.30 on Saturday morning, so, you know, you do what you can do. I feel like everything within reason. I usually make enough water for the oatmeal and a nice cup of coffee. Let that sit for a little bit. If you don't have a French press for camping, I would strongly consider getting one if you drink coffee. I mean, there are some other really cool options I've seen at REI and different places that are quick, simple coffee drippers, but I've got this French press and it's got some plastic protectors on the sides to keep from breaking. It is glass. You know, I like these Stanley thermos mugs because they seal and literally keep my coffee hot all morning into the afternoon actually. What I really like about them too is that they seal on top so I don't have to stir the coffee in here. I literally can just shake it like this. I got coffee and almond milk and a little bit of organic sugar in there or I'll put stevia in.
One of the nice things about not setting up the rooftop tent and instead sleeping in the back of the Subaru last night is that I'm really out in this very open exposed area. As I mentioned earlier, this is Bureau of Land Management property. It's free to camp out here. There are a number of people camped dotted around the area. There really isn't much out here other than shrubs, um, desert grass, and that sort of thing. But every once in a while you can find a tree. Usually there's no leaves on the trees or anything like that, but I have a tree here that I've camped at a couple of times, and the nice thing about not having the rooftop tent up is that in the morning when I got up, the wind had blown in a different direction. So it had been going from west to east, so I camped on the east side of the big cluster of trees here. But when I woke up, the weather was coming, the wind was coming from the north going south, so I just started up the car and rotated around the tree to the south side of the tree, and I have um, some protection from the wind again. So that's something to consider when you're thinking about the type of rooftop tent that you get for your vehicle. The rooftop tent I had on my expedition trailer was a Magellina airtop, and um, that one just went straight up. There were some pros and cons. I mean, if it was up on top of my Subaru right now, there wouldn't be a fold-out piece and there wouldn't be no ladder sticking uh, out the side that's actually supporting the rooftop tent. It would just be going straight up and there would probably be a, a ladder but I could just move that to the side and drive the car around with the rooftop tent fully extended. But um, you know there's some cons to that type of a rooftop tent as well. With this one I have a lot more room on the inside and uh, the air tops don't tend to have an attachable awning so if it's raining when you open up the side of the rooftop tent on those style uh, rooftop tents, they you're immediately out in the elements, and that's not really all that exciting to experience when you wake up in the morning and have to get out to make breakfast or go to the bathroom or something. You're immediately in the rain the minute you open up the zipper. So this one here offers a uh, not only a, a full awning, and there's actually a little canopy over the top of the door so that when even if you don't have the awning attached, it's still protecting you from the rain the minute you open up the tent. So I really like this rooftop tent compared to the air top that I had before. But again, it's much larger, which means that it needs uh, actual ladder support as opposed to the other one where it just pops straight up. So I want to make a couple comments about overlanding. I've been involved in North America's overlanding movement since probably about 2009. What I'm doing right here is not really overlanding. Let's just be clear about that. I'm on a road trip, and there's a difference between road trips and overlanding, and there's a difference between car camping and overlanding. And I want to sort of make that distinction, mostly uh, from my perspective. Um, what you're seeing here is me right now camping in my Subaru Outback with a rooftop tent, which is sort of a hybrid, I guess, if you will, of taking a road trip and doing a little bit of overland activity. So I've driven three, four hours to get to where I am on the highway. I've been exploring things that are on paved roads, uh, and I'm camping out of my vehicle. Now, in order to get to where I'm going, yes, I've had to do some fairly remote off-road driving, and having a, an off-road type vehicle that can get me there is, is pretty ideal. And um, having the space to be able to do the things I want to do in this particular vehicle uh, kind of infuses some overland principles. But for the most part, uh, what I believe overlanding happens to be is um, establishing a vehicle that you can use for long-term expedition 
and conveniently and comfortably live out of that vehicle. Now, what you find oftentimes is I uh, take a Land Rover, Defender, somebody throws a rooftop tent on the top, um, and in the back of the vehicle, instead of having tons of gear piled up everywhere, they've got things organized. They've got a refrigerator that's running off an auxiliary battery that's charged by a solar panel. They don't have a cooler with ice. They don't have to worry about going to refill ice or something like that. Uh, they don't necessarily have to set up an entire kitchen. Um, when they get to their camp destination, or they're, they're on their way to their destination and have to camp overnight, uh, it's a quick and convenient way to, com to set up your rooftop tent in a matter of seconds, pull out your kitchen, uh, open up your refrigerator and pull out some food, make some dinner, slide it all back together, and pretty much you don't have much scattered around your camp. And you can set up in a matter of minutes, you can take down in a matter of minutes and be off and running. You know, I, I think the idea of a rooftop tent in the overland world transpired out of places like uh, Africa and Australia where when you're camping in your vehicle, especially in a Defender or something like or a Land Cruiser or something like that, uh, you're fairly high up off the ground anyway, but if you put a rooftop tent on top of the vehicle, there's probably a better chance that you're not going to get eaten by lions. Uh, here in Arizona and in, in the Mojave Desert of California, you have things like cougars, mountain lions, uh, bobcats, coyotes, uh, rattlesnakes, scorpions, things like that. So having a rooftop tent is kind of nice. It gets you up off the ground. Plus, if it's raining, you don't have to worry about your tent being on the ground. Sleeping in the back of your car is certainly um, a road tripping, car camping, and overlanding exercise. It all depends on the setup that you have. Uh, in, in my case, I've had Jeep Rubicons with rooftop tents. I've had Jeep Rubicons pulling adventure trailers that had rooftop tents and, and uh, kitchens built in. In this particular setup, I'm only using a cooler with ice, so this isn't really set up as a long-term overlanding vehicle. Uh, it certainly would suffice if I wanted to live out of this vehicle and travel around the United States or travel to South America. I could certainly use this vehicle, and I would just have a little bit more setup. If it was raining or I felt in, I was in an unsafe place, I could sleep in a locked vehicle. Or if I felt comfortable and safe and, and so on, I could sleep in the rooftop tent. The only problem with sleeping in the back of your vehicle, of course, is that it takes up a lot of your room for equipment. So if I was going to sleep in predominantly in the back of my vehicle, I wouldn't have the rooftop tent and instead I'd put some Pelican cases or I'd put a Yakima box or something up there to keep all my gear upstairs and then sleep in the back. But if I were traveling to South America, I probably wouldn't want to do that. I'd probably rather keep my valuables inside of a locked vehicle and then sleep on the roof and then just keep some sort of self-defense up on the roof with me or camp in places where I felt relatively safe. Overland vehicles come in all different shapes and sizes. You can have uh, Unimogs, man trucks, off-road campers, Land Rovers, Toyota Tacomas with rooftop tents, expedition trailers. There's a wide variety. In fact, there's a lot of people that overland around the world on their GS motorcycles or even on their dirt bikes. I've got a friend who uh, he and his wife before they had children they basically traveled around the world on a KTM dirt bike so when when people criticize whatever vehicle somebody's driving I definitely have gotten some criticism about choosing an, or a Subaru Outback versus having my Rubicon or something like that when people criticize saying that's not an overland vehicle I mean in my opinion they're full of and that's mainly because they don't really truly understand what overlanding is. If you go to Overland Expo, they're going to tell you and they're going to talk to you and they're going to show you that it's not really about the vehicle. It's about the person and it's about how well they can drive and it's about their passion to get out there and travel. Overlanding, obviously there's a lot of technical skill involved in having a vehicle that can get you through really tough spots. Uh, and many of those spots I can get through with this Subaru Outback, but in many, many I cannot. So... Having the ultimate vehicle that can get to you where you want, where you want to go, not where somebody else thinks you should go, not in a way somebody else thinks you should get there, but where you want to go, how you want to get there, it's entirely up to you. Overlanding is about a mentality. Overlanding is a passion for expedition travel, distance travel, living out of your vehicle and seeing the world, getting to remote destinations, and of course it is the journey, not just the destination. In fact, it's probably more the journey than it is the destination and really enjoying and appreciate, appreciating that journey the entire time. When I'm camping in this super outback, I have some setup and it probably takes, you know, the rooftop tent maybe takes three minutes. 
uh, but setting up my Oz tent table and setting up my stove and things like that prob probably take another 10 to 15 minutes. Take down takes a little bit more time because now I have to pack all of it back into the vehicle uh, in a convenient way and an organized way. So that next time I want to take it out, it's, it's, it's easy to take out and it's, in, or it's, it's organized. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's not overlanding. Overlanding, again, is a passion. So if I wanted to make my overland experience more appropriate to what I believe overlanding truly is, I would put an auxiliary battery in the Subaru Outback, which I could do in the spare tire space of this vehicle since I have a spare tire on the back. I would have the solar panels charging the auxiliary battery, and then I would put in a pull-out refrigerator and not have to get ice. There's a good example. I might have a slide-out counter that pulls out underneath that refrigerator and has my kitchen built in so I don't necessarily have to set up a table. And I still might keep a side area open for gear like um, stand-up paddle boards or uh, fly fishing gear or something like that and still sleep up on the roof in the rooftop tent. So anyway, I welcome and I invite anybody who wants to share their ideas about the Subaru, about overlanding, and more than welcome with people sharing uh, thumbs down if they don't like Subarus or uh, sharing some comment that they have in their belief system because I honestly could care less about all that. I'm out here doing what I want to do. I'm out here creating a YouTube channel that I want to create the way I want to create it with my own kind of content and I'm building a brand the way I want to build it. All of that is, is all a part, in my opinion, of the passion that goes along with being an overlander, being an expedition traveler, being a backcountry ultralight backpacker, or what have you. In the overland world, they have a saying, go slow, go far. Um, the tough part about Joshua Tree this time of the year is, is getting a spot to camp. If you don't make reservations ahead of time, your luck is pretty thin. It's Sunday night, so I decided that I'd stay through to Monday so I could get a spot here and go around and shoot some really nice footage of uh, the rock piles and so on. Um, I did get a spot. It's a decent spot, but it's not uh, compared to a lot of the camp spots in this park. It's it's, it's okay. Um, there's a lot of spots that are literally right underneath the boulders. Uh, but I'm, you know, who's complaining? Later on this evening, I'll probably go off to one of these boulder piles here and climb up to the top and watch the sunset. See if I can't get up to the top of one of these boulder piles, get some really nice sunset footage. Looks like that goes out. Let me go back behind me here a little bit. It's a very beautiful place. If you've never been to Joshua Tree National Park, I definitely think you should put it on your list. It's a great place to come to when 
it's cold in other parts of the country and make a road trip out this way go to LA or San Diego and Vegas all those Palm Springs all those kinds of places if you are into that kind of thing and then stop off here at Joshua Tree National Park which is really an extraordinary place my favorite place to camp here is called Hidden Valley and it's a first come first serve campground and this time of the year it's almost impossible to get in there and that's mainly because this time of the year all the rock climbers come here from the northwest and, and all of that and they just occupy that whole campground but there's a northeast side of Hidden Valley campground that's got a dirt road and it goes around uh, a huge boulder pile and on the opposite side of the, the road from the boulder pile, it's just a beautiful flat desert um, that eventually goes up to some other awesome buttes. But in that valley, it's all Joshua trees. And when you camp right below these enormous boulders, uh, it's just such an awesome contrast between being right there with your fire right next to a huge boulder and then looking out over this amazing desert and seeing all of these Joshua trees. And then the other side of that is... Hidden Valley Ranch, which is an old ranch that used to um, operate here. And then when the National Park took it over, of course, the ranch stopped operating. And you can still take tours of the ranch. It's pretty cool. But uh, I'm having an awesome time out here. My hands are a little cold. I did bring some gloves. I've got about four or five layers on here just so I could sit up here until the sun went down. And I have a headlamp. I have a pretty good memory as to how I climbed up these boulders and how I'm going to get back down and back to my vehicle and camp up on the roof tonight. It's probably going to be colder up here than it was last night down in the valley. It's really interesting. Palm Springs is in the bottom of the valley and from Palm Springs up to Yucca Valley you do a pretty serious elevation gain on the highway and then from Yucca Valley to Joshua Tree, the town, uh, you climb again. And then from Joshua Tree, the town, to the campgrounds in Joshua Tree National Park, you climb even more. So I'm not really sure what the elevation is here. I'll have to look at that. Maybe I'll post a little note at the bottom. But uh, it's pretty high up in elevation, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be fairly chilly tonight. if you guys do much of this kind of stuff when you're camping but I like to make popcorn so I'm going to show you how I do that I put some coconut oil in the bottom of our pan here and then I add a little bit of sugar I put some of these organic popcorn seeds in the bottom here. Let's get that warmed up first. 